the court to the cloud. So a little recap, last class we talked about factorials. Now factorials were a way of arranging values, but the idea was that if you had, let's say five individuals that you needed to arrange, you had five slots for them to be arranged in. A permutation in the example that we did, we had three individuals with three slots, right? But a permutation, you're restricting the number of slots that are available. It's kind of like musical chairs. So you have five individuals, but only four chairs, right? So we want to know how many ways the people who are participating in the game could end up being seated, you know, when the music stops. So when you look at the structure of it, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to what, what we just did. In fact, I'm going to do a fair amount of copying and pasting. And what I mean by that is I'm going to do like almost all copying and pasting. And then I'm just going to trim out a couple of things. Right. So instead of having three people that are going to be ar arranged in three slots, I'm going to have three people arranged in two slots. All right. So that would eliminate this stuff. But virtually everything else is the same. So not too much different in terms of the way we write things or the way we would carry out the process. All right. So any of three people could occupy the first position. So it's still the same, the same what if scenario where I'd look at it and say, well, I have three people to work with. All right. If the first person selected was person C, then that means that there's only two people available for the second slot. All right. So that, that's as far as we would get. We could also kind of think of this as really the same question as the part of the factorial, because it's really the same, the same uh, underlying logic. Because if I say that I'm taking three people and I'm lining them up into three different positions, you know, position one, position two, position three, that's the factorial, three people, three slots. Three people, two slots is really like, all right, any of the three could be in the first position, any of the remaining two in the second position, anyone left over, take a walk, get the hell out of here, all right? You still have to deal with the fact that that extra person exists, they're just not part of your plans, all right? So you say, all right, any of the three here, any of the two there, Oh, uh, the one left over, bugger off, get out of here, all right? That's really all we're up against. It doesn't always play out that way, but when you're dealing with a permutation, it, it often does, all right? But the notation, notation is kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting. The way we would write it, so that that's six, instead of saying a factorial, we would write, three P two, All right? The P stands for permutation. So that part should be easy enough. But the three is the number of individuals available. So I'll say number available. Number of slots. And you know, I'll actually be a little bit more specific. Number, of, I'll write the individuals. I don't want to say people, even though oftentimes individuals implies people. In statistics, we use individuals to the, the term individual to represent the, um, the singular, right? So, uh, an individual could be a, a single chair, a single um, flash drive, a single TV, a single um, cough drop. You, know, you can tell I'm just looking around my room here to see if uh, I can come up with ideas. But 
That's really it. You know, so how do you get this on a calculator? Because if you had something like 3P2, that's not a big deal. And, and I don't want you to get the idea that 3P2 means three times two. I would ask you to kind of question that and say, if 3P2 meant three times two, why the hell would we need the notation of 3P2? What would be the point, right? It has to mean something more than that. That, that two after the P is talking about the number of positions available, it's just coincidental that it happens to be two. Right? But if I had something like 99P50, I'd have to draw out 50 slots, start with the number 99, and then decline or decrease from 99 by consecutive values, 98, 97, 96, 95, until I've used up all those spots, and then I'd have to multiply. That sounds terrible, right? So instead, on our Desmos calculator, we go to functions. You have under stats, the option NPR. So you bring up the function NPR and then type in three comma two, and it'll just spit out the value, right? So the the issue that we're always going to run into when it comes to technology is sometimes the math way of representing a, a, a computation and the way technology accepts it is slightly different. And so we have to make that adjustment. So we write it on paper as 3P2, but on the calculator on Desmos, it's NPR 3 comma 2 right? on Desmos. All right, so when you see something like 5P3 in that example that I have below, this guy right here, on Desmos, it would be function stat NPR 5 comma 3, close it up and you get your 60 that way, all right? So it's not too bad at all. Let me check the old chat here, permutation. Yeah, so that, that's what it stands for. Yeah, no problem. So <clears throat> the formula, NPR equals N factorial over N minus R factorial. Uh, this is a more mathematical way of doing it, but it's also kind of interesting. I mean, it's definitely very interesting, but you kind of have to be interested in the math behind it in order to find it interesting. So that's, it varies from person to person, but let's say, well, I don't have an equals yet. Let's say I have three P2, like the example above, that would be the same. You can see the ends occupy consistent positioning. And you know, this is a, this is a, like a little nostalgia for me because this is how I learned it back before calculators existed. No, that's not true. Um, I found out that the calc that graphing calculators existed long before I started going to high school because none of my teachers knew how to use them until my senior year. That's not true, maybe my junior year. But still, it was like the end of the line. So it's like all those years I could have been using that stuff. You know? no, Desmos wasn't even a thing. It was a, it was a dream at that point. Uh, so three minus one, oh, I'm sorry, three minus two. This technique relies on you having a sense of factorials, but that, that shouldn't be a problem. Factorial is the easy, the easy part of this. So three factorial. over one factorial, three factorials, three times two times one, one factorial is just one, so six over one is six, all right? So you can get it using a formulaic approach, you can get it on the calculator, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a fun endeavor, you know, it's more puzzly kind of uh, experience when you're doing it uh, by hand, but, 
you know, you always have the ability to, to go back to the calculator. That part's up to you, you know. So that, that's what a permutation is. It's a limitation of a factorial. All it's doing is it's really just saying, okay, we're, we're playing musical chairs. We got 20 people, we got 18 chairs. We got 15 people, we got five chairs. You know, like who's gonna win? How many ways can they win? That's, that's the permutation. Now a combination, which is what we're gonna get to in a sec, that's limiting it even further, All right? The key word when it comes to factorials and permutations is the word arrangement, All right? So anytime you're arranging something, you're talking about factorials and permutations. But whenever you're talking about grouping, you're dealing with what's known as a combination. But let's kind of take this, you know, as its own example without getting into formulas and stuff like that just yet. So we have five students in a class. So those students are A, B, C, D, and of course, E. We want to determine the number of two person groups that can be generated from the five available students. Right? So one way of handling it, and you know, like if you're a teacher in a class, you might you might actually do it this way. You're not thinking to yourself, all right, well, let me let me get the old calculator out, the old Desmos calculator, and run some numbers here. You're probably thinking, all right, I'll put uh, Sam and uh, and Jackson together. I'll put Christina and Michelle together, I'll put, you know, and, and, you know, just go down the list there until you've used up all the individuals in the class. Now, you're probably not even doing it randomly. This, this assumes that you're at least taking into account the possibility that randomness would be a thing, right? Because you, you take into account personalities, like these two people don't work well together. These two people work really well together, you know, but if you're doing it in a really random sense, then you might consider doing something like making a tree diagram. That gets a little lengthy, you know, depending on how you construct it. But you might, you go a little simpler and create a sample space. And that sample space would be saying, all right, I only want the unique pairings of individuals. Because if I tell you that we have Charles and Billy in one group, and then I say, okay, that's group number one. Group number two is Billy and Charles. I say, well, wait a minute, you already got them. You've already counted for those people. So I can't say B and C is in one group and then turn around and say C and B is in another group. It's the same group. It doesn't matter what order in which, the order in which I select them. Right? So what I would do is I would just go through and identify the unique grouping. So start off with A and say, okay, who can A work with? Well, A can work with B. A can work with C. A can work with D or A can work with E. A is not gonna work with him or herself, so I wouldn't include that, all right? Then I'd move on to B and say, okay, well, who can B work with? Well, I normally would say B could work with A, but I already got A and B paired up. That's already a possible combination. B can't work with him or herself because I have to have two unique people per group, so next up would be B and C, and B and D, and B and E. So there's only three different combinations that involve uh, B with someone else aside from who they've already been paired with, All right? So then I'd move down the line, I'll just move this highlighting over, and say, okay, who can C work with? And say, well, C can work with A. Oh, wait a minute, I already got that, A and C. C and A, same deal, right? How about C and B? Well, I already got B and C, B and C, C and B, same deal. So C and D, C and E, all right? So then I look from the perspective of D and I'd say, all right, well, who can D work with? D and A, got it, A and D, same thing. D and B, got it, that's the same as B and D. D and C, C and D, same thing. D and D, well, D is the same as D, so that's not going to fly. How about D and E? Ah, that's a unique one. So D and E. So we have one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different groupings. So if you're thinking to yourself, there's got to be an easier way, number one, or whoa, all that, and there was only five students. I hope he doesn't ask us for 10 students or 20 students or anything like that. Some combination of two ideas is where we're going, right? Because yeah, I'm going to ask you for cases where there's more than five students and yeah, there's an easier way, right? So. Let's take a look at a permutation and see how that compares. So if I were to say, all right, I got two people per group, I might look at that and say, okay, that's two slots, all right? So two slots, meh, and then an additional meh, so two mehs. Any of the five people can go in the first position, so five. Once I occupy that position with one of the individuals, there's only four people left for the second for the second slot, five times four. Well, that's gonna be a 20, so that, that can't be it. But if you look at the relationship, if I can get the dang point to work, that gives you a result of 20. Compare that to what we came up with, and you start thinking to yourself, hopefully, oh, well, that's exactly double what we should have, maybe I just divide by two. Maybe it's a permutation divided by two all the time. I, that goes back to the idea of permutations versus factorials and you know things like that. If if it were that simple, we would not need a new word for it. You know, it would be okay. Well, sometimes you divide your permutation by two. That that's not what's happening here. Close though, right? If you think about it, A and B had a corresponding B, A, right? If we flip the order, we could say A and B, B and A. We, we disregarded the B and A because that was the same as A and B. Same thing with the C and A, the D and A, the E and A, right? the C and B, the D and B. So all the reverse values, we eliminated that because it was overkill, right? So it's really just a question of figuring out how we can divide out the overkill. So what we look at, because I need to know what this is going to be. Let me make it a nice looking box here. That is not a nice looking box. For the record. For the record. Right, so divide by two. We know it's supposed to ultimately end up being equal to two. All right. So it's just a question of what it was that led to that two. So the skills that we've learned so far involve permutations and factorials, right? So maybe, well, we've already used a permutation. Maybe it's a matter of using a factorial. So what I would look at is the number of different ways that I can arrange two values, right? So let's say, for example, and I'll just kind of put it off on the side here. We have A and B, B and A, right? So that's from the letters A and B. I'll put a comma there. Those are the different ways that you could arrange the letters A and B, right? So if I tell you that I want to line up two people, Tommy and Joey, right? Well, it could be one arrangement, Tommy in front of Joey. Could be the second arrangement, Joey in front of Tommy. All right? So that part's all right. All right. We could do it for other possibilities. Maybe we could say B and C. Right, if I have the letters B and C to work with. Uh, it could be B first, then the C, then it, or it could be C first, then the B. All right, so these are our possibilities. So in each case, it seems like there's two arrangements. All right. And that's going to be the same for every other case. Any other pairing of letters, there's always going to be two ways in which I can arrange them. All right. So two arrangements, poor quality for the bracket. Two arrangements per pair of letters.
All right. So then it would beg the question, all right, how can we get that number in an easier fashion? Well, the easier way to do it would be to say, well, I have two things and two slots, really, because I have a slot here and a slot here. Here's my first item, here's my second item. Any of the two items can go in this position. Whatever's left over can go in that position. It really ends up being two times one, and that'll give you the two outcomes that we're looking at. So if I were to say that I wanna take two letters and determine the number of ways in which I can arrange them, it really is just two factorial, all right? So that's just gonna be two factorial. So then it begs the question, it's on up with done thing. So two factorial, three dots in the form of a, a triangle just means therefore, right? You write the word out if you want. So that's telling me that the bottom of my fraction should have been a two factorial. So what we wanna do here is really kind of generalize this, all right? I don't wanna have to do all this work every single time. If I do it every single time, then it's a waste of time. You wanna generalize, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, the top seems to be, well, five things, two slots, that top seems to be 5P2, based on what we just learned above. I want the gloves. Sorry? Oh, I thought there was a question. No? It's standard. Oh, sitting. Thanks. Oh, let's go that way. The 5P2 gives you the top, but the bottom just seems to be two factorial. So then you just kind of look at the numbers that were given to you in the original problem and see if there's a way that maybe we could generalize that to a, a more um, universal way of doing things. And that's where the next page is gonna come into play, right? Because a lot of this is the, the theory behind it. We're building towards an understanding, but yeah, like it, it's, it's what I've been saying. I mean, yeah, you, you wanna understand it, but you also wanna get stuff right too. And you also wanna, to streamline it, become more efficient, and so on. Worst case scenario, you got that diagram there, that'll get you your answers. It's not, I mean, I made it look kind of nice, colorful and all that stuff, but I was gonna say it's not pretty. It's not, it's not something you're looking forward to. It'd take a while, especially if there's more than five students, all right? But if I tell you that there's a nice little shortcut that'll crank this all out for you, as long as you recognize a couple of key words along the way, That'll help. The key word is group, but more so it's an intuition. The fact that we're not dealing with an arrangement. I don't care in which, what, what order the individuals were selected. I just care that they're selected. Now, you just kind of imagine you got a handful, you know, your arms are filled with like groceries. You're coming home from the supermarket or you got books, you know, you're just walking down the hall of your school, whatever. You just loaded it for bear. You got all this stuff in your hands and you just need a couple of people to help. Hey, can, can a couple of people help me? Uh, oh, well, who do you want to help you? I'm like, oh, thanks. Don't all jump up, jump up at once. Uh, and it's like, oh, okay, Tommy and Jimmy. Well, uh, uh, Tommy, then Jimmy or Jimmy, then Tommy. I don't care. I, I just need the two of you. Come on, let's go help. You know, that that's a combination, right? But on the other hand, if it's like Tommy and Jimmy are running in a race and first place gets you a flat screen TV and second place gets you a, a $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card, then it does matter in what order they're selected. So, you know, that, that, that would be an arrangement and that would be a permutation, All right? So this whole computation, which ultimately ends up giving you the 10, oh, that's not a 10. 
that's going to be in a shorthand way of representing it. And I'll resize a little bit. We can write that as NCR, which is a combination. I'm stealing my own thunder a little bit. I'm just going to move some things over. Just going to move some stuff around. So this would be 5C2, <clears throat> but it follows the formula or the model NCR. Now it's going to be our third, yeah. Uh, this is our third coming up. Coming up. We did two. Christ almighty. So go into my handy dandy Desmos calculator. NCR, I'm going to type in, oh, that's all this stuff. five comma two and we get our 10. All right, so it, like in terms of typing the values in, you're gonna get, or at least you're, you're gonna follow the same process that you would for a permutation. You just need to know under what circumstances you're using a permutation model, the NPR versus the combination model, the NCR, all right? So the, the term itself, that you're looking for, really, if you kind of kind of bring it down to brass tacks here, you're looking for groupings because pretty much everything else is just going to be an arrangement. Right. So if you identify that it's only the groupings without the order being important, you know, the case where you have an arm or two arms filled with groceries and you just need a couple of people to help you out, doesn't matter what order they come to help you out, that's going to be a combination. Right. So I'm going to flip it over to the next page. And we're looking at number four, five students are in a class. Exactly, NPR is arrangement and NCR is for grouping. Yeah, you know, you live long enough, you see everything, I guess. It's really kind of fascinating. I'm just, I'm just kind of like mesmerized by this. Are they lifting weights? Is that what's going on there? I don't know. I don't know that I need to see that. Uh, uh. I don't know. I can't even tell. Is he even going to do a rep? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You balancing it? I, I, I got nothing there. It's hard to tell. So, ah, there we go. So, I mean, hey, we all make it work somehow, right? Five students are in a class. Determine the number of three person groups that can be generated from five available students. All right. So we're looking at really the same, same idea. And you can see below we're kind of formally getting into the concept of a combination, but it, it really is just kind of boiling down to the same thing. Again, we're just taking the five people and creating groups, right? <laughs> Mental reps, exactly. Very good. So we could actually work off of our previous answer. And, and we talked about this uh, over, over the last couple of classes. And sometimes probabilities uh, can be, they can be pretty intense. Uh, you've discovered this, you know, like it, it, there's some mental gymnastics going on. But if you can kind of, kind of find a shortcut through the maze, you'll, you'll end up thanking yourself for that. So if you really just take a second to think about it, Five students are in a class, determine a number of three person groups that could be arranged or generated from the five available students. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab my little diagram here. And 
this diagram, and I'm going to reproduce it on the next page. And I'm going to space it out a little bit and get rid of some check marks. And you know, after I'm done editing it, it'll be like, you could have just wrote it again. I know, I, I kind of fall into that, that little tug of war. So, oh, hey, get over there. I heard, um, it is a little bit off topic, but I heard that in Jersey City, I think it was Jersey City, because of the spike in COVID, that they're requiring that uh, gym specifically, because you know, it's relevant now, um, gyms are required to shut down every hour for a half hour for cleaning. And it's like, wow. but you're telling them to close what you're saying i mean that's the only interpretation i mean if you're if you go to the gym i mean the, the only person that would be all right with that i guess is the person who's popping in at the right time for like a 20 minute workout you know that that's pretty insane i mean i guess they got to do what they got to do but geez yeah right how did we get on this gym conversation there's been there's been a lifting theme for the past five yeah uh one of our one of our classmates sir, was uh pumping iron in the in the gym there, I forgot. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay. Multitasking plus uh, yeah. increases stimulation, so respect. Yeah, it's like fresh out of dodgeball. You know, it's like <laughs> sometimes I like to break a mental switch. My goodness. So, uh, it's all, all fun, I guess. So, I got this diagram going here. And I got my little 10 groups there. It's such a nice looking answer that I, I hesitate to, to erase it. I kind of feel like I want to keep that. All right, so I'm going to modify my picture here. And so the, these are the individuals, because we talked about this over the last class or two, where sometimes figuring out what you don't want will figure out, will help you figure out what you do want. All right, so if I create a group of two, for example, a group of two, by default is going to give us an additional grouping of three people. These are the, uh, the leftovers, the people we don't want. I mean, it's pretty terrible when you think about it that way, but, but that's essentially what we're looking at here, all right? So if I tell you, you got a, you got a class of five students, for example, and you need two students to run out, you know, run up to the main office to grab something from your mailbox. You know, you're a teacher, you're asking them to do, something, do you a favor. And you need two students for some reason. You're creating two groups when you do that. You're creating a group of two, the two students that are leaving the, the classroom, but you're also inadvertently creating a group of three, which are the students that are being left behind. And really, if you think about it, maybe you're not inadvertently creating two groups. Maybe that's intentional. Maybe it's like, all right, I got to get rid of these two students. They're not, they're not uh, the nicest people in the world. So let me, let me give them a, like a task to do. Let me send them out of here. And, uh, and when you do that, it's like, okay, well, now that they're gone, yeah, you know, like, let's have some fun. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's kind of a dark way of looking at it, but it, that's kind of the idea. Or it's like, um, I'm trying to think of a case that doesn't involve excluding human beings. Um, I would probably stay away from farm animals. Uh, uh, yeah, you can look at like, yeah, yeah. So let's say you have, uh, you, you know, you put out dinner and, and you have uh, an assortment of vegetables, you know, and, and for some reason you quantified them specifically by you have exactly three carrots and two potatoes. And it's like, all right, well, 
I don't want to eat the potatoes, for example. So I'm going to generously offer those to two people. Okay, so here, uh, who wants some potatoes? Oh, you could have potatoes here. One, one for you, one for you. And by doing that, I'm creating a set of three, uh, three carrots that are available for, you know, as the leftovers, you know? So it's kind of like a, a, a byproduct, but it's a byproduct that creates a group. So if I have a group of AB, um, necessarily creating the group of leftovers CBE, same thing with AC, a leftover group of uh, BDE. A, D, that would give me B, C, E. And you know, as tedious as this is, I'm still gonna go through it because it's like, well, I'm, I'm really just relying on work that I did for a previous answer to help me with this one. So B, C, D. So long story short, I, I wouldn't even have to come up with this entire list in order to know, wait, it's going to be the same answer. So my good looking uh, answer of 10 groups, I still I can still keep that. I'm going to take a look at the chat in a second. I see some things there. So A, D, E, A, C, E, E. That's when I knew I was going to be a math teacher when my um, high school pre-calc teacher and calculus, as it turned out, um, he called me ace one day. And it was like, oh, that was so nice. I think that means I'm good at math. And so 25 years later, here I am, A, B, and it's funny because I have a, a colleague that absolutely hated that teacher. So it's kind of weird. And, and also just human nature where you can have two people that have very different experiences with a teacher. And yeah, that's, that's how it goes. You know, humans are humans. But it's nice. It's nice when I remember someone fondly and when they remember me fondly. Happened today when I was getting a flu shot. They go to the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm ready for I'm ready for bedtime too. Yeah, um, yeah. It was kind of nice. Uh, the, the lady who ran the um, the flu shots at my school was like, "My son had you as a teacher, and he thought you were the greatest." And I was like, "You know what? That's that's just nice. It just makes my day." Yeah, I know I'm not the greatest, but I'm not the worst either. So it's right where I like to be, exceptionally ordinary. So, so this is what we're looking at. We got all these different cases where we have groups of two followed by groups of three. So it's just in this case, we want, we want the leftovers. We want the other guys or gals. But it's still going to be 10 groups. Nick, I could have done this with a little bit of a shorter approach. We, we want five, uh, sorry, three person groups from the five people. So five C3 in Desmos. I know it's detailed below, but in Desmos, that would be NCR five comma three. All right, so a little, uh, no. I'll just keep it there so we have a basis of comparison. Function, MCR, five comma three, boom shakalaka, we got a couple of tens. That's pretty nice, all right? But it also leads us to a conclusion. It's called, it's a variation of a complement rule, but it's complement rule for, uh, for counting, right? And that tells us, so, and it, it's detailed below, but I'll, I'll just say it here anyway, because we're in, kind of in a group. So we have a rule here that if you have something like N C R, right? I'm just leaving it in general terms. That's going to be the same as N C N minus R. Right. Now that's a that's a little bit funky in terms of the notation. We we don't like the notation too too much. So 
a quick example, if I say I have something like 20 C2, that's going to be the same as 20 C20 20 minus 2. All right. So 20 C2 equals 20 C18. All right. Uh, if you're wondering about the penmanship today, it's because I forgot my Apple pencil at school. So this is. Uh, and sorry, why are you using um, C instead of P here in the combination set permutation? Uh, because of the, the fact that it's groupings rather than arrangements. Right. If it were, if we cared about the order, then it would be permutation. But because we just want the people, we don't care. It's the it's the grocery example. Like I just need help. I just need three people. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, and you can verify. So again, NCR. I'll do something. You know, like a little bit bigger in terms of the the example. Twenty C two, one hundred and ninety. I wouldn't want to make that list. You know, and so little duplicate action, save yourself a little bit of time. And 20C18 gives you the same thing. So it's, it's a nice little nifty recognition that you can use to, to arrive at the answer a little bit quicker, right? But only if you really see it. If you gotta get to a point where it's like, ah, I think that's a rule, I'm not really sure, let me check it on the calculator. You could have typed it in on the calculator three times by the time you do that. So you don't want to really go down that road. It's really more of just like a site recognition thing. Save yourself the time, but only if you recognize it. Okay? That, that kind of comes more with experience than anything else. Um, when you see the examples below, these all are examples with a purpose. Um, it's evaluate by hand and then evaluate using a graphing calculator. Um, when you do it by hand, some of them are easier than others. So the permutation one, that, that's, that's not pretty if you were to do the whole thing out by hand. But since what this is telling me is that you have 14 individuals and 14 slots, so I could actually just do that real quick and then follow that up by saying that I would never do it this way. But three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14. So then 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. You do that one time and you realize, oh, wait a minute. That's the same as saying 14 factorial. So instead of writing all that stuff out, I could have just gone with 14 factorial because whether you multiply 14 factorial out, like we listed it out here, 14 times 13 times 12, all the way down to one, or if you type 14 factorial in your calculator, I'm not gonna know the difference, right? So, oh, I forgot, this is the one where you just go for the exclamation point. So that would be the, the lovely answer here. Um, that being said, when you look at an answer like that, there really is no expectation that you would put that answer down for anything on a test because it serves no purpose. You look at 8.717, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's an estimation of the true answer a lot gets lost. When you move over the decimal point, 10 units to the right, you're gonna have a couple of zeros at the end that, that are really just approximations of the true answer. So this, even though it says by hand, this is actually a better answer than the true uh, decimal answer, right? Because there would be an overflow that would cause estimation in any calculator. And the exception would be if you're using like Excel or something like that, which you can, manipulate the rounding to go out. Like if you wanted to go out 20 digits or something, you can, you can make it happen. But it's all right to leave an answer in terms of factorials. Think of a factorial kind of like a radical. 
Like if you, you just think about any class where you studied radicals, sometimes the answer was just radical two. You'd rather write that than 1.414, blah, 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 and then round it, you lose accuracy. So you just write the radical two and then call it a day, right? That, that's really what we're going for here, all right? So the 14 factorial kind of has the same feel as something like radical 14. Like there, it doesn't serve a purpose to expand it. Now, if it's something like five factorial, sure. Yeah, that's 120. I'm gonna write that 120 is a nicer number than five factorial, but 8.71782912 times 10 to the 10th power is not a nicer number than 14 factorial. So you look at what you typed into the calculator and look at what the calculator spit out. I want the nicer one, all right? So sometimes the nicer one involves you doing less work. I mean, sign up for that any day, right? So the second question is 5C0. For that, we would want to use if we're doing it by hand, we would want to use the, the formula, which we kind of discovered on the previous page to be this one, but a nicer version of it is this one. Because that speaks in terms of N's and R's, right? So here's my N and here's my R. My N and R's look almost identical, so I got to fix that. And, and they both look terrible. So like, I mean, there's, there's no clear winner there, All right? So five factorial over zero factorial times five minus zero factorial. Now there's one fact that you'd have to know in order to make this work. And we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes when we get there. And that is that zero factorial this guy is somehow equal to one. Now, I'll show you why that works the way it does in a couple of minutes. It's actually a, a riveting tale. All right. So this is the same as saying one. So I can kind of cancel that out. Five minus zero is five. So five factorial over five factorial anything divided by itself, whether it's factorials, permutations, combinations, think of the most complicated expression in existence, divided by itself, the result is gonna be one, All right? So that's what it would look like by hand. On the calculator, as you know, much simpler, function MCR five comma zero, gives it to you right away. All right, but the lesson here is twofold. One, we got to figure out what that zero factorial thing is all about. Like zero involving multiplication, how on earth could that be equal to one? That doesn't make any sense. So I'll help you understand that in a minute. But also a generalization. You might start wondering, well, wait a minute. If the R value is equal to zero in a per, in a combination. Does that is that always going to be one? That's a hell of a question, and it's something that you can actually test out if you have a suspicion. When it comes to Desmos, you could always test it out using Desmos. So function, NCR, just put in some dummy variable for for the the n value. Yeah, I mean you could try to use n. Sometimes it doesn't work, but if I say NC zero. It'll ask me if I want to create a slider for n because I'm, I'm telling it that I want n to vary. I want that first value to vary, but the second value I want to remain at zero. So I'll add the slider here. And when I slide along, now permutations don't work for negatives. Permutations, combinations, factorials. You, you can't arrange negative items. You can't, I mean, we can try to arrange zero items, but if you arrange zero things, they're like they're, you get a break in the logic. So we only focus on positive values and we only focus on whole numbers. So when you set up your slider, you might want to start it off at one, make it some high number and make sure that the step, which is the increments that it goes by is, is going to be one. So it only goes by whole number values. Now you can start at a zero too if you want. I mean, it really doesn't make a difference on the low end as long as you're excluding the negatives. 
Right. So slide along and you could see no matter what value I put in here, I think I might accidentally type in 10 for this step. No, no, it's just, uh, maybe, let me make that a little lower. So it's really kind of hopping around on me. But no matter what that high value is, that end value, the MCR is always equal to one, right? So there's no change there, All right? So we- um, can, Sorry, can you explain why, why it doesn't change from one again? Because the R value, if the R value is equal to zero, the the uh, the combination is always going to be equal to one. Oh, okay, thank you. And you know, philosophically, that just boils down to the idea that you're taking. So this is this is the five person classroom, right? So five people in the classroom, and I say, all right, I need none of you to go to the main office right now, and and get my mail for me. How many ways can that happen? You might look at it and say, well, there's no way that that can happen. Well, I'd look at it and say, well, there's one way that that can happen because nobody leaving the room is the same as everybody staying in the room. And there's only one way that everybody can stay in the room, right? They're all just staying put. I don't care about the arrangement. I care about the fact that this unique collection of five people we're all staying in this room, right? So that brings us to C, which is kind of the other end of that coin. So by hand for C, yeah, it's, it's the same kind of setup where it's like, oh, we gotta get into this uh, factorial business. 14 factorial over 14 factorial times 14 minus 14 factorial. So a lot of repetition here, but the computation part of it is really just to support our, our theoretical understanding because the 14 divided by 14, any, anything divided by itself is gonna be equal to one. But then you also have this part here that gives me a zero. So again, we're coming back to that idea of one over zero factorial and so far, we're taking it on faith. You're just believing me. That's, that's an awful risk. You're believing me that zero factorial is equal to one, and I got to prove it to you, right? which I am happy to do in a couple of minutes. But I'd also look at this and say, well, I got a one again. I want to make sure that that's going to happen. All right. So the notation is getting across the idea that I have 14 people, and I want to create a group of 14 from those 14 people. There's only one way to do it. You know, if I say, you know, just kind of think of it this way, you know, you're, you're a tour guide and you're taking your, the, the people that showed up for the tour uh, on, on to, you know, like you're gonna take them around the museum and you can only handle 15 people. You know, each tour guide is only supposed to take 15 people. You're like, okay, so, I'm gonna break you all up into groups. Let me just count you off. And um, I'm gonna get 15 people with me and I'm gonna get 15 people with Maria. All right, so one, two, three, four, four. Oh, there's only 15 people. All right, well, you're all coming with me then. Or I need, I need some time off. You're all going with Maria, I'm gonna sit this one out. Yeah, but if that's what the grouping calls for and that's what the number of people are that are available, then that would just be your one group. Right now, if it were an arrangement, that's a different story. Then it would be like, okay, I got to line all these people up. How many ways can I line them up? Different conversation. But here, it's just how many people are available. How many? How many? Uh, how many groups do I want? How does this work out? Now, when I pop this into the calculator, function boom, fourteen comma fourteen, still get the one. You can play around with different values here. You can do the whole slider thing again. I already have a slider for n. So I can say n comma n. That allows for the first and second value to be the same. All right, so first and second value, in this case, I have it at 82. 80C, 82C, 82, result of one. 63C, 63, one. 29C29, 29 29, 1. 100C100, 1. 
right? So it checks out no matter what the low value is, no matter what the high value is, if they're the same, it's gonna give you a combination value of one, which is very nice. You know, it's something that you can rely on. Right? So it kind of, uh, it streamlines things, you know, noticing those properties and, and those relationships goes a long way, All right? So I'm gonna put stars on the next two questions for you to try on your own, but I do wanna take you through the mysterious zero factorial, right? Because I, I can show you here. I mean, this is by no means a proof. It's just you believing somebody who's not me. Zero factorial is one. All right, well, you believe me now because the calculator proves, you know, like that's, that's how it goes, right? Somebody else said the same thing, so it must be true. Yeah, no. So we need, we need, some, we need some more evidence here. So n factorial is equal to n my uh, times n minus one factorial. All right, where am I getting that from? I'll show you. Um, oh, I already shot the, shot the mark. That's this general rule for factorials. We played around with this a little bit last time. All right, that's all I'm doing. I'm just kind of referring back to that. All right, so let's take a look. Oh, overshot the max. Now I could look at this a couple of ways. Since I'm looking for zero factorial, I could do this. I could say, okay, well, I'll let n be equal to zero. So zero factorial, off to a good start. Zero times zero minus one factorial. Run into a little bit of a problem there though, because negative values when it comes to counting has no meaning, right? So we're not going to arrange negative items. So this, this strategy or this approach wouldn't really work. However, if I go to one factorial, I'm going to kind of um, use a backdoor approach here. Right? So I'm going to let n equal 1. Right? So So everywhere I see an N on the right-hand side, I'm gonna replace with a one. So one factorial we know is equal to one. One minus one is equal to zero. And then by established properties of algebra, like identity and, you know, Pem dots and things like that, we can say the right hand side is just going to simplify down to a zero factorial, which equals a one. All right. So we get we get a proof, we get evidence that zero factorial is equal to one. But in terms of an intuitive understanding, it's still kind of a little iffy. It's still kind of tricky because you look at it and say, well, yeah, but it's still got a zero. How can I arrange zero things? Uh, it's the same way that I can send zero people to the main office to get my mail. Right? If I have zero things, I can only arrange them one way. Right? That is to say, well, here's my nothing. I have a nice arrangement of nothing. There's nothing to move around. Right? It's just a set of nothing. Right? But there's one collection of that nothingness. But it's really, again, more so like not so much what we're talking about, it's what we're not talking about. So when I say that I'm sending no people out of the classroom, that's saying that I'm keeping everybody in the classroom, right? So if I say that I have, you know, like when you think of an arrangement, you might think of flowers, you know? So if I wanna create an arrangement, I wanna create a nice bouquet, I wanna create an arrangement of flowers, what I could do is I can go to the florist and I say, okay, you have all these wonderful flowers over here. I'd like to make an arrangement of those five different types of flowers, right? Then I, don't, then I realize I don't have any money. So what they can do is make an arrangement of those different flowers. I'm shit out of luck. So they get their flowers, I get nothing. The arrangement is still happening but I get nothing out of it. So I have nothing to arrange, 
but they have everything to arrange. They're still going to make whatever arrangement they're going to make, but I have the, the nothing as a remainder. And there's only one, one thing that I can do. I am the one person with nothing, the one person I got to take a hike. It's all over. Right. So that, that's kind of more of a philosophical way of doing it. If I say I have no idea what you're talking about, I really have one idea. Yeah, the one idea of the nothing that you understand that I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Exactly. So that, that's the um, that's really the justification. So it, 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 for probability and, and counting specifically, it's a lot of mind bending stuff. But if you can kind of um, you know, come up with an example or a strategy or, you know, just kind of a, um, you know, just a way of thinking about it that works for you, then that, that's the way to go. But uh, what I just try to do is come up with all, all these different anecdotes and see what I can come up with, you know, to see if I can get one that, uh, that lands. Um, on page 35, we got all these shortcut rules. They're wonderful. Uh, but again, uh, they just kind of, uh, they're placeholders for what we do in the calculator. Um, and, and we've talked about them all, so they're all there. It's just a question of, uh, you know, just kind of making your peace with them. But then we get the applications and I think time-wise is probably where we're going to end for tonight. Well, we'll see. May have to go a little bit further, but, um, the shortcut rules here, they're wonderful. Like I said, you can use them, uh, but you could also use the calculator. Good example here. We have find a, uh, the probability that of five selected people, because we had to tie it with probability, uh, no two share the same birthday. All right. So, and again, it's they're asking a question. We want to interpret that in a way that makes sense for the probability. So, in A, they're really asking us the probability all five. birthdays are different. All right. So if you're saying that no two people in the room, you have five people in a room, no two people have the same birthday, we're saying they all have different birthdays. So that's what we got to look at. We got to say that the first birthday is different from the second birthday, which in turn is different from the third birthday, which in turn is different from the fourth birthday and followed by being different from the fifth birthday, right? So you gotta think about how people can have birthdays, you know, under what circumstances might a person have a birthday? Well, the first person, if you're looking at the five people, the first person can be born any day of the year without restriction. All right. We don't know what their birthday is, but we got to assume that they could be born at any time. So they're, they have 365. We're just going to assume 365 to not get too complicated. They have 365 days to work with. All right. Any of the 365 out of the 365 are fair game for that person. The second person has the burden of not being born on the same day as the first person. So we have, again, this is the first person. This will be my second. And third, fourth, fifth, and so on, All right? So the second person, if they're born on the same day as the first person, then we fail, all right? So let's say the first person is born on January 1st. Then we're not talking about like the year of birth, just a day. So that the second person could be born on any day other than January 1st, which means that they have 364 days to play with. Out of a total of 365. So there's still 365 days in the year. We got to look at it with replacement because it's not like we're removing days from the year. Those are still available because people still can be born on the same day. We're just looking for the cases where they're not, right? So the third person can be born on any day other than the days 
that the first two people were born. So first person was born on January 1st, second person was born on April 15th. Those are two days that are eliminated from the set of 365. So there's still 365 days available in the year, but the third person can only be born, if this is gonna work, it can only be born on 363 of those days. Once you get a sense of the trend, you start realizing, oh, okay, we're just decreasing. Across the top and keeping the bottom the same. All right. So then when you look at this, it's not so much of recognizing keywords like perm, you know, like I was gonna say permutation, but I mean arrangement or groupings or things like that. It's more so that you look at this and say, wait, this is a case where you have five slots and you're declining value, starting with that high number of 365. That's what you do when you solve a permutation problem. So this is the same as 365 T5. Now you could look at that and say, all right, cool. Why would I have to write that? Couldn't I just multiply 365 times 364 times 363 times 362 times 361, get that answer and be fine. My answer to that is, well, look at the next problem. 45 people instead of five people. That's a lot of multiplying, but we definitely want a shortcut. Right? So then the bottom is just 365 being raised to the fifth power because it's an identical value being multiplied by itself five times, right? Now, sometimes what I like to do is ask the question, instead of asking for a probability, I'll say, give me an expression that could be used to, to, to give the probability for the sentence. So I wouldn't want the actual answer because sometimes the answer is just a nightmare. You know, it's just hideous. Sometimes I just want this notation. If I do want the answer, I'll give you rounding instructions. I'll say, uh, round your answer to the nearest three, uh, three significant digits, or I'll say uh, simplest fraction form or something like that. I'll give you more of an indication. But if we do want to know, we can put it in the calculator. And I'm going to do, oh, I don't need that, division, all right, because it's a fraction. Then I go into functions, the NPR, 365, comma, 5, and then on the bottom, 365 raised to the fifth. And you can see here, we're looking at about 0.973. All right, now, logically, you just kind of play this out. You only have five people in a room. If I tell, if I told you five complete random individuals, so complete strangers, they don't know each other, there's no affiliation whatsoever, just randomly selected individuals, put them in a room, and I said, hey, guess what? Chris and Josina have the same birthday. You'd be like, holy crap. You, you grab five random people and two of them have the same birth. How did that happen? Oh, that's, that's pretty lucky, you know, or unlucky, depending on your feeling about that sort of thing. You know, but it, it's not likely, you know. So this 0.973, right, you got to, at least the quality of that number, you should be feeling pretty good about. Yeah, it should be a high probability, right? Now, if I told you that we had a thousand people in a room together and I told you that none of them had the same birthday, You'd be like, all right, something's wrong there. Like you have that many people in a room and not one common birthday. Uh, somebody's lying about their birthday, right? Because after you hit the 365th person, you'd have to have you'd have to have some overlap. Because let's say the first 365 people all have different birthdays. Every single one of them somehow has a different birthday. The 366th person their birthday has to match with one of those 365. So there, there is a declining probability as you increase the number of trials. So when we get to the next example, you'll see, oh, all right, it, it, the probability is going to change. It's not always going to be a high probability, but you can tie your common sense to it because that, that's, that's part of the fun when it comes to probability. You're like, oh, 
this answer makes sense. This answer doesn't make sense. Why? Because that's not how the world works, you know? So in, in part B, where it says probability at least two share, this, uh, share a birthday, right? So I'll write it as opposite. of our answer for A, right? Because if we're looking at in A, all the birthdays are different, then in B, when it says at least two share a birthday, that means that maybe two, exactly two people have the same birthday, maybe three out of the five have the same birthday, maybe four out of the five, maybe all five of them have the same birthday. That would be shocking, but it, you think something was up if that happened, but bottom line is so it would have to be the opposite of all the birthdays being different so this one you know once you read into it a little bit you don't really need a formula you just look at this and say okay one minus 0 0.973 is 0 0.027 so then you kind of start looking at this and say okay well in number seven, this is exactly the same question as number six, except it's 45 instead of five. So why not take my answer, what I did on the Desmos calculator, and just tweak it a little bit? Right? So change my five into a 45. So this is this is the equivalent of part A in number six, where it would be all 45 individuals having different birthdays. You tell me that there's 45 people in the room and they all have different birthdays, that's definitely gonna be less likely than only five people in, in the room having different birthdays. The more people you have in the room, the more likely they are to share a birthday. Still not, still not guaranteed to happen or impossible to happen, but you know, it's, in the, it's getting closer and closer, right? So subtract this from one, and we see now that we're looking at, and I could just kind of pop this in there. Little things in life. Oh, that little stray mark is gonna kill me. Ugh. I got I got ways. No ways to handle it. Just got to break out the old white pen. There we go. Where is this extra? So that's essentially talking about the same idea, right? But much lower probability because, I'm sorry, much higher probability than the 0.027 because the likelihood that, that there's gonna be a common birthday is, is a little bit more uh, pronounced. Now, if you wanna get a little bit more crazy with this, you can do what we did before and just create some dummy variable for the bounds. Or I'm sorry, the little, ah, dang it. And create a slider so that you can see what's going on with those probabilities as you increase the number of trials, right? um, increase the number of individuals in the room. Right? So I want this to go away. I, just gotta, I guess I gotta live with it. Right? So I can slide my slider, make it start at zero, go to, go to 400, only go by ones. But you can say, so five people in a room, if I can get it to land on five, it uh, doesn't want to. All right, well, six people in a room, very small. 45 people in a room, that's my 0.94-ish. It's getting larger and larger. When I get to 100 people in a room, it's almost one. Then it says undefined because it just the numbers got so huge that that it just gave up. 
because it's trying to compute 365 raised to the 155th power. So it's just given up. But it's at, at, at a certain point, it's like, well, yeah, I'm not going to do the math, but yeah, it's one. You know, once it hits over 365, it starts recognizing it as, all right, well, it's a certainty now. The, the, numbers, are, the numbers are large enough. Do you have to do it with the Desmos? No. You know, you can, you can crank it out, you know, manually, but sometimes doing stuff like this is, is useful because, and I've been mentioning this in all my classes, you do something like this for one of the problems that we do here, and then you save it. And, you, you know, you call it birthday problem. I got a lot of extra stuff here that I don't really need for the birthday problem, but you know, I can I can trim all that stuff out. I mean, I got a lot of stuff that I don't need, but trim all that stuff out and save it so that when you come across a question like this, if you do, no hint there, you're totally coming across a question like this. Uh, on a test, then you have, you know, the, like you have it set up and ready to rock and roll, you know. So you save it, call it the birthday problem, like I said. And then when you go to do it on a test, you have something ready to rock and roll that you can use. Uh, you can use it as a reference, All right? Oh, a different answer on Desmos. Okay, so it it depends on how you typed it in, but if you um, if you typed it in the way I did it, you should have got the same answer. So it might be a matter of maybe just using a different function. Uh, this should be a permutation, so hopefully you weren't using a combination. That, that would be a, a reason why you would get an error, but I'll just do it again really quickly so that we can just make sure that I didn't screw it up. But for uh, 6a, it's function NPR 365, 5, and then 365 raised to the 5th. Right, so that was my part A, and then I just tweaked it from by subtracting from one, and that gave me my part B. I did a little, uh, little funny rounding though. Actually, that should be a, a point zero two seven one. All right, I'll do it a different way really quickly. So as a fraction, if you didn't like the permutation approach, you can do. You know, it might take a little while, but, you know, in the absence of a better alternative, then, you know, this is what you do. One, and then 365, and three, it's just five times. And so you can get it that way. But again, that little adjustment of subtracting it from one makes all the difference, right? And that, you know, so what I was mentioning before is that, if you were to do this for 45 selected people, obviously you don't want to you don't want to do it this way. This is, it would take a while, at least not on purpose. If you're stuck doing it that way because you don't remember how to do it with the permutations on a test, yeah, start typing. You know, 365 times 364. Keep going until you use 45 slots. You'll get the right answer. It'll take a little while, but you'll get there, and then uh, and then you'll be good to go, right? Um, but yeah, now the um, the other one, it was one minus the fraction NPR 365, 45, and then 365 raised, oh, not divided by some of them, raised to the 45th power. And so that's where that decimal comes from. Okay, so hopefully that helps. So let me stop this video.